when a murder is discovered. It was right on the sidewalk where the shooting had occurred. The shot came across three lanes of traffic as the car was in motion. It doesn't just destroy one life. I couldn't understand why. Why would somebody do such a terrible thing? It tears communities apart. You can still speak to residents now, and they say they've never got over it. They still feel deep sorrow at what happened to a young man in the midst of their little community here. It's up to the police to not only solve the mystery. Our hope is that where we were going was going to provide us with a treasure chest of information. And track down the killer, but bring them to justice. The absence of a head or hands can impede identification, but it certainly doesn't make it impossible. In this episode, the case of a 14-year-old runaway becomes something more sinister. She was supposed to graduate with us. <laughs> she may not have been in the same classes as everybody, but she was still one of us, so it was hard. Meet the murder detectives. On my 17 years in investigations, I've worked several child abuse cases, both physical and sexual. I've worked a few death investigations. I've worked other homicides. But this particular case, to me, is the most important. Who reveal how they caught the killer. The polygrapher was asking him questions, and right from the get-go, he was bombing the test. Something terrible. On either side of the Mississippi River in Illinois lie the towns of Dubuque and East Dubuque. In 2011, a 14-year-old girl called Cheyenne had not turned up at school, and the police had been called. I first heard of uh, Cheyenne Kersher as a missing person from East Dubuque, Illinois. A uh, report went out to all agencies that she had been reported missing. Dave Hackmeister was a detective in the Joe Davis County Police Force. Over the next two years, Cheyenne's case would involve police from three different forces. The initial missing person call came into Chief O'Connell in East Dubuque. She never came home from school that they knew of. They went out looking and called family and friends and such. And uh, when they couldn't find her on her own, then they called us. And they said that she had run away and that they had a note that she had left in one of their cars. Chief O'Connell was assisted by East Dubuque patrolman and detective Luke Kovacic. Chief O'Connell called me and had me come in um, because we were um, going to start calling a bunch of friends and family members. Two of the first people Luke spoke to were Cheyenne's grandparents, Gary and Mary Jo Kircher. Oh, she was a peach. She was so bubbly. I don't think she had a mean bone in her body. No. I mean, she was forever smiling or singing or, you know, stuff like that. She's always just a plain good girl, you know. Lots of fun to be around. We found out she was missing actually on October 13th in 2011 and didn't know what had happened. They were told this was being treated as a runaway case, as Cheyenne had left a note. We did hear information that there was a letter that they found that said something to the effect that, you know, nobody's to blame, I just don't want to be found, you know, I'm okay, and that was it. And then on the 31st, which is a few days after, well, my wife's birthday, she had never missed a Halloween at all in her birthday. And I told my wife, I said, something's really wrong because even if she would have ran away, she would have got a phone and called and said, you know, happy birthday, Grandma. And that's when I, you know, kind of felt it was going downhill from that. So now it's past Halloween, or it was a day after Halloween, and she didn't show up. So at this point, if she's going to miss that, then I'm thinking that she really doesn't want to be found or something is now not adding up right. Cheyenne's case was not the sort of crime the local police were used to dealing with. It's a river city. The attraction to East Dubuque is the bar closing at 3.30 in the morning. There is a lot of DUIs, there's a lot of bar fights, there's a lot of public intoxes. Um, so that's the stuff that we, I personally, you know, deal with. As East Dubuque Police Department was small, 
the county force also helped out. Cheyenne Kersher's case was typically routine, seemingly, and there didn't appear to be any foul play. We did, however, send one of our investigators over to assist East Dubuque in anything they may need. Detective Casey Folks was asked to help look for the runaway teen. It was, I believe, a Monday morning. I was at home. I was sicker than a dog. I was contemplating calling in sick, and my sergeant called me and said, East Dubuque has a missing girl, a teenager from East Dubuque. So with the temperature, you know, not feeling up to it at all, you just go, because that's what you're paid to do. It's your job. The East Dubuque force was already searching Cheyenne's favorite hangouts. Cheyenne liked to go to the park, and so we would look around the park in places where maybe she could stay, uh, sleep, be. The school was another favorite place of hers. There's a playground, the football field is there. She could have been anywhere. She loved the library and she loved learning, and the teachers were so good to her. The one time there was a rainstorm, and a lot of kids weren't going to school because it was raining so hard. She walked from where her house was at up to the elementary school in the pouring down rain. She looked like a wet rat, they said, when she came in. The teachers took her off the side. They always have like sweatpants and sweatshirts there, got her in some dry clothes, got her hair dry and then put her other stuff in the dryer so when she could go home. But that's how much education meant to her. We had made a visit to the house, to Cheyenne's house. I did not go in the house at that point in time. I just stayed outside. We also made a visit to the school, and I cleaned out Cheyenne's locker. We kept everything that was in that locker. We also interviewed a guidance counselor. What I knew about Cheyenne was that she needed some tender care. She was a student who liked attention, maybe not always positive attention. It could have been negative attention. She struggled with some social settings. However, she really wanted to belong. She needed to belong, and she felt very proud that she was going to be a high school student at East Dubuque. The people at the school were very concerned about the entire situation. We were told by school personnel that Cheyenne's home life wasn't the best. She lived with her mom and her stepdad, Terry Abbas, and then another adult male that Cheyenne would share was her mom's boyfriend. And then she had an older brother and a younger brother. She seemed always a little disheveled. Social services were called on the family. As a matter of fact, I had called them at least once myself. She had a heart. I mean, she was genuinely a very good girl. She just was a product of her upbringing. Cheyenne also had difficulties at school. Classmates like Ashley Herbst were very aware of her problems. I think she was bullied about her behavior and how she would have outbursts and stuff, and she couldn't control her behavior. And to some kids, that's uncomfortable. And so you might look at that as different. Concerned Cheyenne could have run away from problems at home, police questioned her family. I interviewed Cheyenne's mom at the East Dubuque Police Department. An informational interview. It was, uh, let's run through the history of the family, let's run through why Cheyenne might have run away, because at that point, we had the runaway note. In a case like this, where a child grows up with um, a very unconventional family, and also simply an abusive family, there was living with mother's boyfriend and ex-husband. And when you look at the amount of risk factors that were in this case, you're almost guaranteed that you've got either a future victim or a future offender or somebody that may escape those things but is going to have many issues that they need to overcome, which is quite a bleak way to look at a case like this. After speaking to Cheyenne's friends and family, it seemed very possible she could have run away. At the end of that particular day, we had learned that Cheyenne had been the victim of bullying at school. We had learned that Cheyenne's home life was not the best. So we were, at that point, leaning towards and confident that we had a runaway 14-year-old that was hiding out somewhere with a friend in Dubuque. With no news of Cheyenne, a local campaign was launched asking for information. The posters and billboards make it more serious. Not that it wasn't serious before, but when you see that there's more action being taken, this is a serious manner. Where the heck did she go? 
Did somebody take her? Did she really run away? I couldn't imagine that she ran away, but I had a, a feeling of urgency. The longer you wait, the less likely of a positive outcome. We had sightings of Cheyenne, but the two years that this case went on, we were never stopped getting reports that Cheyenne was seen. And so we always run the belief that she was a runaway. The family believed Cheyenne would one day just return home, but with no solid leads, the police search slowed down. The East Dubuque police did everything they could do and beyond. At this point, Dave Hackmeister from Joe Davis County Police Force was setting up a critical incident response team to deal with unsolved cases. The Cheyenne Cursor case became very important to us because it was a 14-year-old girl that had been missing for a year and a half and had not been heard from. So we picked it up as a cold case in hopes of finding her alive, possibly hiding from some realities in her home. Cheyenne was well known in the community, and officers from many police forces in the area signed up. One of them was Eric Heffel from neighboring Galena. We talked about her not having a lot of resources. She didn't have money. She didn't have a whole lot of even friends, unfortunately, to help her out. Uh, we talked about the fact that there was a runaway note. Did she write it? Did somebody make her write it? And there's a lot of different scenarios that could have played out that we talked about that way. It was around the end of August, beginning of September. I got a telephone call from the FBI agent on the team. And he had gone up to La Crosse, Wisconsin to interview, at that time, Cheyenne's best friend. He got done with the interview and he called me and the first words out of his mouth, I'll never forget, were Casey, she's dead. I know she's dead. By 2013, 14-year-old Cheyenne Kircher had been missing for almost two years when the local sheriffs handed the case to a specialist police team. There had been a heightened sense of worry for Cheyenne in the East Dubuque community because of the length of time that she had been gone. School officials were concerned. Citizens were concerned. I knew Cheyenne a long time. Basically since I can remember her being a little kid, and I would say that was maybe around you know 2000, sometime in that area. I can remember her walking around town. She was either usually walking or riding her bike. She would always stop, she would talk, she would uh, come to the police department. As time went by, we did balloon releases and stuff to always like remember her. There was a lot of search parties going on trying to find her and stuff. It was kind of hard for students to even really grasp what was going on. Cheyenne's family were still hoping that the teenager would just turn up, but were beginning to fear the worst. Well, I was hoping that she did run away. She would have at least phoned me or something. So I just was hoping that she did have enough of that family and did run away. Because the alternative is real hard to accept. I would actually expect somebody like this girl to run away. She fits all the high risk categories for somebody who'd be a missing person. The thing that would be unusual is the fact that there was nothing. There was no trace of her. The fact that you have her there one day and her gone with nothing, no phone calls, no contact with friends, that's the bit that's, that's unusual. Hope of finding Cheyenne soon vanished when one of the new police team interviewed her best friend at school. He said she was emotional. He said she was a wreck. She had not heard from Cheyenne once in that entire time she was gone not once. So that was the turning point in my mind that now we need to start focusing on this other aspect that Cheyenne's been murdered. Lead detective Dave Hackmeister was no longer treating this as a case of a runaway teenager. Once we ruled out the fact in our minds that she was a runaway, we honestly felt that the worst had happened, that she was deceased. And now it was up to us to find out who in the family might have participated, if they all knew about it, if anyone was involved in the family. Cheyenne had shared her home with her mum, her stepdad, 
and her mum's boyfriend, as well as her two brothers. The family was a little bit unusual. Um, they were, I hate to go as far as saying a dysfunctional family, but not your typical family. And the house was a terrible mess. According to friends, Cheyenne used to spend as little time as possible at home. Greg Herbst was the superintendent at her high school. Because Cheyenne's life was somewhat unconventional, I don't know that people had their red flags up at first. It wasn't until after time started to lapse that people started to wonder if there was more to this. Although Cheyenne had the surname Kircher, her father, as named on her birth certificate, wasn't her biological father. He and Cheyenne's mother separated when she was eight. Her biological dad, I don't think anybody knows who he is. Cheyenne's last name of Kircher is from a person, he put his name on the birth certificate, but later on in life found out that he was not her biological father. From the history I would gather from records and from Cheyenne, Terry Abbas was the closest thing she knew to a father besides the person she had previously known as her father for the first eight years of her life. Even though it had been almost two years since Cheyenne had last been seen, the new task force started from scratch in tracing her last movements. We talked to a lot of people that had stated they had seen Cheyenne. We had a psychic call in. We had numerous people we spoke to across the river, which is Dubuque, Iowa, that knew her. We tried to run down every lead or every tip that we possibly had at that time. Although a bit of a loner at school, Cheyenne had been very active on social media, so the team looked online for clues. Cheyenne had been on the internet speaking with older men, so that was a concern of ours. The FBI then sent to these various locations, and they were multi-states. It was from Florida to Texas to Alaska. We found no evidence at all that even though she had communicated with a few of these people, that they were involved in the case. What we determined was that no one, to the best of our knowledge, had ever seen Cheyenne Kirscher since she went missing. But we needed to refocus and take a look at the family and uh, see if in any way that they were involved in her disappearance. The mom was a suspect, mom's boyfriend was a suspect, but we were kind of keying in on Terry Abbas, the husband. When Cheyenne came to school, she would tell me a lot about her home life. One time her stepdad, she called him Terry. And she was very upset because she got home from school and her mom was at work and he was on the computer. He was looking up porn and other girls, and she threatened to tell her mom on him. It was just not a very functional, normal family life. The team began to focus their investigation on finding out more about Cheyenne's relationship with her stepfather. During the course of the investigation, I had learned that Cheyenne had disclosed to some of her friends that Terry Abbas had been sexually abusing her. He definitely gave me the creeps and probably every staff member here the, the creeps. I mean, there was just, you could just tell there was something not right about him. Although there was no proof Terry Abbas sexually abused Cheyenne, the police were convinced he had been a threat to her. He became their number one suspect. We're a little bit concerned uh, of a couple of things. Number one, that he might flee. Number two, we're hopeful that he might trip himself up if he's really nervous about our investigation and he might go back to the uh, scene of the crime. If he did, in fact, murder Cheyenne, he might try to move the body or conceal it more than it is. They decided they needed to follow Terry Abbas's every move, however they could. We did not have surveillance on Mr. Abbas. Unfortunately, we just didn't have the manpower to do it. That was one of the reasons we wanted the tracking device to see where he would go if he would flee. But we also were of the mind that he wants to keep up the illusion that he's still cooperating. And so he's not going to go anywhere. He's going to stick it out as long as he possibly can. Certain Terry Abbas knew something about Cheyenne's disappearance, the task force agreed to place a tracker on his car. The family was a, a family of campers, so they had a variety of different locations that they would camp at in the woods. And we thought, hey, if he uh, did, in fact, 
kill a little Cheyenne, uh, that might be one place that we might want to be interested in looking at. So we were hopeful that he would lead us to a place like that. So we went, we placed the tracking device on the vehicle. So I fire up the computer. I'm anxious to see where is this guy going? What's he doing? So I had followed him. He was tracked from his house. I believe he went to a gas station. And then he's going across the bridge into Iowa, and the tracking signal stopped. Just stopped dead. Police suspected East Dubuque teenager Cheyenne Kircher had been killed by her stepfather, Terry Abbas. They had placed a tracker on his car, but the signal had suddenly stopped. And I'm like, OK, what, what, what happened? Did he find the tracking device and throw it in the Mississippi River was my first thought. Whether it was removed or fell off, the tracker was no use. The team decided they now needed to confront the family with the possibility that Cheyenne had been murdered. We don't have any other evidence going for us. This is a confession case, you know? It's either a confession or somehow we stumble across uh, her body. So we decided as a group, we're gonna bring them in, interview all of them at one time in separate rooms, and after our interviews, send them on to a polygrapher, and felt that that was our best option. I believe it was September 4th, the family members of Cheyenne come in and we all, they all came in at the same time. The only person who didn't show up at that particular time was Terry Abbas, didn't show up for the interview. Terry Abbas' excuse was, I, I believe he had to work, he had other engagements. Someone who doesn't show up when everyone else is participating, to me, is a big red flag. And there's a reason he doesn't want to be there. At the meeting, the rest of the family agreed to be formally questioned and to take a lie detector test. Terry Abbas had no option but to attend. He was interviewed by the team's FBI agent. So on the 18th of September, when we had uh, scheduled the interviews, they all, in fact, arrived. We spoke to them briefly as a group, and then we told them exactly what was coming up. You know, we're going to separate you, we're going to interview you, we're going to find out every single detail as to what led up to her missing, and we're going to figure out why she left. And then, from that point, we're moving you on to a polygrapher. We had three FBI agents trained in polygraph examination, giving three polygraph tests at exactly the same time. I spoke to uh, Mr. Abbas on the way for him to take his test. And at that time, he seemed fairly calm, talked about work to me. It was definitely intentional to let him know that we were going to have a polygrapher uh, waiting after the interview. We want to put as much mental pressure and police presence in their mind as possible. We separated them, we interviewed them all. Mom, the boyfriend, and the brother were seemingly pretty upfront. On the other hand, Terry was again very aloof and just giving very basic answers and not being as specific as we thought he should be. After the conclusion of our interviews went to the polygraphers. Lie detectors don't really work by detecting lies. They're flawed, they can be triggered by all sorts of things. However, the technology itself tends to be very intimidating. And to someone who is of average intelligence would feel that they're giving themselves away. And often they will just confess because they believe that thing can actually almost read their mind. This was crunch time. The team were hoping the pressure of the lie detector would make Abbas crack. The polygrapher was uh, working with him, asking him questions, and right from the get-go, other than the controlled questions about his name and date of birth and things like that, he was bombing the test. Something terrible. The FBI agent carrying out the test informed Abbas that the machine was showing he was lying. And he told Terry that things aren't going well. You're not, you're not showing that these are honest answers and he couldn't buy himself out of this. Abbas was taken out of the room and placed into another interview room with a video camera. We decided we're gonna put Terry Abbas in the videoed interview room because he's most likely the one that would be our offender. 
And if he confesses, we want to have it on video. Well, you got your man. Hey, you got it. Here he is. Cheyenne is not with us. She's gone. During Terry Abbas's initial confession, he told Wayne that he had taken Cheyenne up into the woods behind the house and that they were running around. Cheyenne wanted him to chase her through the woods, which he did, and he was slipping and sliding all over the place. And after he had slipped and fallen, at some point in time, he just blacked out. And the next thing he knew, he woke up and he came to and Cheyenne was dead and his hand was wrapped around her neck. Before I knew it, I was standing over a body. What I can see from this case and the actions of this man prior, during and post the offense, I actually think he was crying for himself that day and crying that he had not got away with it and actually wasn't showing any genuine emotion for his victim at all. But my life is over. It's been over for a long time. I just can't have a face right off you. We'll work through all that. Terry Evans told the FBI agent that he had had sex with uh, Cheyenne Kersher outside the home in the backyard. And uh, following a sexual act, um, he strangled her. To, uh, he had strangled her to death. Last thing I remember, my head was over her neck for some reason. Just over her neck and doing what? Uh, Squeezing, I guess. Uh, what happened to cause that? I had no clue. He had stated that he had dug a hole. It was a fairly deep hole that he did it by himself. He had lured Cheyenne up there, put her in the hole. So during that interview with Terry Abbas, he was asked if he would take us to the gravesite of where he had buried Cheyenne, which he agreed to do. With Abbas's confession, the team had their killer, and the news began to spread. And next thing I knew, I got a phone call from Loopy. He said, you're not going to believe it, Chief, but he said, Terry just admitted that he killed her. Hmm. It was a feeling that's kind of hard to describe, because I knew Sham personally. We all feel the same way, because we have kids, when you know a child has indeed been forced to do sexual stuff and then murdered. Um, but yet you were, we were somewhat happy that we got Terry to admit it, to know that we could find Cheyenne and, you know, give some type of closure to friends, family at that point. So it, it's a mixed feeling. The confession of Terry Evans was kind of a bit of a surprise that, you know, it worked, you know, that he actually confessed. But the act wasn't a surprise. We pretty much had it nailed down to Terry Abbas being the bad guy in this. The team had a confession. But now they had to break the news to the family that Cheyenne was dead. We did speak to mom shortly after his confession, and uh, uh, she was absolutely devastated. Shane's mom, once we had informed her, actually, of the confession and what we were told, she reacted and she became hysterical. She was upset. She was crying. And we advised her what we were going to do as far as trying to locate the site where Cheyenne actually was. Once we did, she was advised, and her and the grandparents, Shane's grandparents, were also advised because they lived in close proximity to where Cheyenne was located as well. I want to say she took it probably like most moms would, maybe. Um, that's about the best reaction I, I, I got out of her. It's really tough. You never get used to breaking news like that to a loved one. You never, ever get used to it. I firmly believe that she felt her daughter was alive. For the almost two years that this case went on, I, I think that she really believed that Cheyenne was just someplace with somebody and uh, was being taken care of. And when she was ready to come back to mom, she was coming. Soon, everyone knew Cheyenne wasn't coming home. She was supposed to graduate with us. 
She may not have been in the same classes as everybody, but she was still one of us. So it was hard. Terry Abbas stole Cheyenne's innocence, but he also stole the innocence of 400 elementary students. Terry Abbas assaulted Cheyenne Kircher. He assaulted an entire community because small towns have an inherent tranquility about them, and he disrupted that. He assaulted the tranquility of this wonderful town. With everyone involved still in shock, the task force began the task of finding Cheyenne's body. Cheyenne Kirscher lived directly across the street from this building, which is an elementary school. It was so close to the location where she was killed, it's really uh, unbelievable. You know, it's hard to imagine that someone could do that, being this close to not only a school filled with kids, but a fairly busy roadway. In 2013, 14-year-old Cheyenne Kircher had been missing for almost two years, but under police questioning, her stepfather, Terry Abbas, had admitted to sexually assaulting her and strangling her. It was 23 months of not knowing. You need closure, but under these circumstances, that's not the best closure. I mean, I was hoping she ran away. And then you find out what really happened. You read it in books, you see it in TV shows and everything else, but till it happens to your family, it's really tough. You know, there isn't a day go by that you don't remember something. The police had their killer, but had yet to find Cheyenne's body. They took Abbas to the woodland where he said he killed Cheyenne and asked him to show them where she was. On September 18th, shortly after Terry Abbas confessed to the killing of uh, Cheyenne Kirscher, he brought the investigators over to this location. Terry Abbas then walks us up a steep embankment into the woods. And as we're looking for the grave, he's looking around, he's handcuffed. And he kind of walks past it. And so I see this depression in the ground. And, and when you fill in a hole, dirt will sink down in. And I see a depression in the ground. And I pointed to him, I said, Terry, is this it here? Terry, wants to take a good look at this. And it's hard. Is this where Cheyenne is? Yeah, it's where Cheyenne is. And how did she get there? By the The grave site was very difficult to see. As you can notice, there's heavy underbrush over there. However, he took us very close to where he thought that he had buried the body. It was a good starting point for us. We were very confident at that time that this was the location that we had to start uh, the excavation. About how far down do you think she is? Um, about 45 foot. And this was a hole that you had dug? Yes. Did anyone help you put her in there? No. You just did this by yourself? Yes. At this point, my feelings are all over the place. I am excited that we've caught the caught the killer. Feeling overwhelmed at the work that I know needs to come. I'm feeling sadness for Cheyenne because she's been alone in this grave for 18 months and nobody knew where she was. From there, we came down, we called in some of our assist units who roped off the area and we had to wait until the next day to start our excavation. The fact that he was willing to kill her, to murder her, to get away with sexual abuse, suggests that he's not just a very dangerous sex offender. He's also a very dangerous violent offender, likely to be very cold, calculated, potentially has some personality flaws that makes him very narcissistic or very antisocial. Although Abbas had confessed, the team needed to determine how Cheyenne had died and see if Abbas's story matched the facts. Next day, we had state police and FBI forensics come in. The crime scene people uh, roped off everything and started the excavation of the body. But after some time digging, the team found nothing. On Friday, 
Following Terry Avis's arrest, we were well into the excavation of Cheyenne's grave at that point. We were digging and digging and we weren't finding anything. And I was getting a little nervous. The FBI agent on the team came up to me and he's like, hey, we just got a call from the jail. Terry Abbas wants to talk. Abbas was a feckless, psychopathic pedophile. He was somebody who had a continuous career of endangering others, which made him very, very good at concealing his activities, very good at lying, very good at covering things up, just as he covered up the grave. Some things don't make sense, um, according to what we talked about the other day. But I'd like you to, to tell us a little bit more about what happened that day. Things just don't add up. Casey was hoping Abbas would now tell them why they weren't finding Cheyenne. During that interview, it was about 30 minutes into it, when he confessed that he had actually dug the grave the day before, uh, giving us premeditation for the murder. She didn't even see the hole up there. I got lucky on that part, I guess. Abbas was changing his story from the one he had told in his confession. But he didn't stop with the grave. He also solved one of the biggest problems the team had faced when Cheyenne went missing. During that second interview, we were able to get from him that he had Cheyenne write the note about a month before the murder actually happened. He said that the note was actually going to be a practical joke, that he and Cheyenne were going to pull on Cheyenne's mom, that Cheyenne had run away. That's when he started to formulate his plan of killing Cheyenne. What I believe happened is he had been sexually abusing Cheyenne for many years, and that Cheyenne had already sort of told on him in July and maybe had threatened to tell more people about the sexual abuse that he was doing to her. And so he had to eliminate the problem. And so he forms this plan in his mind. Now he's got a note in Cheyenne's handwriting that he can plant after he kills her to throw the police off the trail which early on is exactly what happened. That he can go to that extreme measure, not do what most sex offenders would do, which would be to groom the person, threaten the person, make it that that person is very scared to tell somebody. But he took it to the extreme of getting rid of the person who could get him into trouble. But it suggests a lot about his personality. Working with Abbas's new information, the forensics team finally found Cheyenne. I was there when the bodies excavated. We were going down two or three feet and there was nothing, and we weren't sure if that was even going to be the exact spot. And then one of the FBI uh, evidence technicians stated they had found a little, like they called them friendship bracelets, but we had found out through our investigation that she said she wore that bracelet to keep the demons away at night. And there's pictures of her wearing this black and white bracelet. So when they found that, we knew then that we were in the right spot. We just needed to go a little deeper. Once Cheyenne's body was exhumed, we were all very confident that the work that we had done was definitely more than sufficient for court purposes. I didn't see how he was going to get out of this at all. I mean, very good, solid case. The team now had all the evidence they needed to put Abbas away for the murder of Cheyenne. So it was just under two years. And for two years, she was probably less than 100 yards from her mom's house. Um, she was buried in a grave on a hillside in a wooded area, a place that nobody would probably go to but Cheyenne. He had actually started digging the grave a day early, took cigarette breaks, supposedly went down and checked on his son down at the house. How can somebody be that cold? I want to see that sucker suffer, not just be sitting in a cell and, you know, staring at four walls for the rest of his life. That isn't fair. A lot of states do not have the death penalty, but I think there should be a little window that if something like this or a baby or any of these, that's different, then they should get the gas chamber, whatever that state has. He was charged with murder. He confessed and he pled guilty. And when most people are still trying to raise bond to get out on a crime, 
Um, he was trying to plead and go to prison. I mean, he wanted it over with as fast as he could get it over with. Cheyenne's killer had been caught. And in downtown East Dubuque, 40-year-old Terry Abbas went to court charged with her murder. Terry's first court appearance, he decided that he did not want an attorney, that he was going to uh, uh, be his own attorney. Uh, the judge had uh, told him to really think about that hard. I just remember the feeling of being in the courtroom with Terry. I think some people wanted to actually just maybe visualize what he's like to see what kind of person could do something like that to a child. As Abbas pleaded guilty, the court case was over quickly, but it revealed the details of Cheyenne's death to the rest of the town. I was asked to go to the courthouse to give a victim impact statement on behalf of the district and on behalf of myself. And I remember that very clearly. And I was asked the impact that it had on me. Um, I became, understandably, very emotional. And the comment that I had made at that point was that Cheyenne Kircher was not my daughter, but she was one of my kids. When you work in a school district in any capacity, the students become your children. When details were released of how she died, it was <laughs> nothing you ever want to hear. Like being strangled to death and no, that's <sighs> scary. No one should ever have to go through that at any age, especially being 14. I think about Cheyenne every day, pretty close to every day if not multiple times a day, because every time I come into this office or every time I file something, her, her case file's on top. From an investigator's standpoint or a detective's standpoint, it's, it, it's a case that you will never forget. The result of the court hearings was Terry Abbas was convicted and he was punished to life imprisonment without parole in the state of Illinois. Television will sometimes portray that there is an honor code in prisons and that crimes against children are frowned upon. So it is my hope that Mr. Abbas is having this code of honor imposed upon him every day for the rest of his life. If that sounds cold to some, I don't apologize because he sexually assaulted and murdered a 14-year-old girl. The whole community was in mourning, and they were determined that Cheyenne shouldn't be forgotten. Right away, when my classmates found out that she was murdered, we wanted to get together and do something. So we had come together and ordered bracelets. They say, shine on, and then it says Cheyenne Kircher. And then we sold them and then bought a memorial bench for her and a tree that was planted for her outside of the high school. And they dedicated the bench, and a lady was taking pictures of everything, and she said, can I ask you a question? And I said, I hope so. And she said, what would Cheyenne think of that bench? And I said, I think she would love it, because it had her picture on it. It said, shine on the whole nine yards. And I said, I think she would love it. And then I couldn't say another word. This case with Cheyenne Kirscher was a tragic case. We all look back at it and we think, you know, how did we miss this? How did society miss this? You think to yourself, how many others are out there? It took us two and a half years to resolve this. Something started out as a simple missing person or runaway. It happens to thousands of young girls and boys throughout our country. We need to look more closely at how we can communicate and really begin our investigation sooner than we do.